Hi, welcome back to the playlist on ethanol metabolism and its implications in biochemistry. In the previous video, what we looked at is a, essentially a roadmap for ethanol. We looked at the possible fates of it metabolically. We looked at the pathways to get rid of it. And we saw that ultimately through a series of three steps, we can take ethanol, a potentially toxic and harmful foreign compound, and convert it into acetyl-CoA, something that can be used by the TCA cycle, something that's biologically useful to us. Well, one of the topics and motifs that we're going to look at in this video and the coming videos is that, as, as strange as it sounds, even though ethanol is something that we can consume through the diet, um, certainly beer, wine, hard liquors have it, ethanol is treated by your body um, as a foreign and toxic compound, and it, it, it can be in large amounts actually toxic. And especially in the next video, when you look at um, the cytochrome P450 catalyzed reaction to get rid of ethanol, I think you will possibly really start to understand um, why we consider it um, a foreign compound. But anyways, let's just some background on this. Um, we have this enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase. Now, it's not ethanol dehydrogenase because alcohol dehydrogenases are um, very much broadly specific enzymes. As you can imagine, there's lots of different alcohols that we could potentially um, ingest and that could get into our bodies. For example, this molecule is ethanol, but what if we take away one carbon? That would be methanol. And certainly methanol is also eliminated by this enzyme and converted it into, in that case, it would be uh, formaldehyde. We can also have isopropyl alcohol. Isopropyl alcohol has an extra carbon attached to the primary carbon here. And isopropyl alcohol also gets metabolized by alcohol dehydrogenase, and as a result, you get acetone, which is a ketone, not an aldehyde. So there are a lot of alcohols, and also some larger ones, that get metabolized by one of the alcohol dehydrogenases. And in general, there's three really important ones. Um, designated alcohol dehydrogenases 1, 2, and 3. And there are some medical implications of those as well, which we'll get to in a little bit. But this is the overall reaction we're looking at here. Ethanol is shown on the right side of the screen here, uh, excuse me, the left side, if I can get my directions right. You can see the alcohol functional group right here, the carbon bound to the OH. And alcohol dehydrogenase is going to do an oxidation reaction, a two electron oxidation using NAD as the electron acceptor and it's going to convert that alcohol group into an aldehyde functional group. And in this case, that one is called acetaldehyde. Now, you imagine you go to the liquor store, you get some Jack Daniels, has a pretty um, decent concentration of alcohol, ethanol, that is, in it. You drink that, and you, could, you, could, you know your physiology, hopefully. The alcohol goes down your esophagus, it goes through the esophageal sphincter, and it gets into the stomach. Now, in the stomach, there is some alcohol dehydrogenases in there. Um, they're not just floating free in the stomach acid. That wouldn't be good because stomach acid, as we know, degrades proteins, denatures them. There's some enzymes that can clip them in there, like pepsin. But it's actually in the stomach lining cells. And there's some alcohol dehydrogenases there that could potentially oxidize some of the ethanol to acetaldehyde. However, this source of alcohol dehydrogenase is actually very minuscule when it comes to the overall magnitude of where it all is. So once the ethanol, um, the ones that at least don't get um, converted to acetaldehyde, they're going to exit the stomach in a bolus of um, chyme that's going to go into the intestines and essentially ultimately get absorbed and go um, to the liver. And it's in the liver hepatocytes where the maximum, the greatest concentration of these alcohol dehydrogenases are. Alcohol dehydrogenases in humans, and when we're talking about the liver mainly, they're cytosolic enzymes. They're just floating free in the cytosol. They're not in the ER. They're not in the mitochondria to any extent. They're, they're cytosolic enzymes. And so in the cytosol, ethanol will get converted to acetaldehyde. So what's the medical implication of this? Well, if you think about this logically, if you have a lot of alcohol dehydrogenase, or at least that enzyme's concentration is maximized, then you should be able to theoretically get rid of more ethanol, right? That's, if you think about it, just that's kinetics, right? That's Mi michaelis menten kinetics. That if you have more enzyme, you get rid of more reaction and get more product, right? You lose reactant, you get product. So if you have more alcohol DH, 
you lose more ethanol, and the concentration of the ethanol goes way down. Well, in any case, when you get this ethanol into the liver, it's inevitable that if the liver enzymes can't get rid of all the ethanol, in other words, can't convert it all to acetaldehyde, then eventually the ethanol will escape the liver and it will end up in the blood and go to the peripheral cells. One of those cells or organs is the brain. And ethanol, it turns out, has a significant effect on the brain. And, and the more ethanol that gets to the brain, the more likely you are to get buzzed and then finally drunk. And we're going to talk about ethanol's effect in another video, but suffice it to say, they're able to bind to something referred to as the GABA receptor. And they function in a very similar way to something you may have heard of called benzodiazepines. Um, Xanax or alprazolam is a pretty common one. Valium is another one. And what ethanol does is it binds to that GABA receptor and therefore promotes its physiological effects. We'll cover that in a much later video. So my point was, the more enzyme you have, the less ethanol gets out of the liver. But what happens if you have a mutation in any of these alcohol dehydrogenases? Well, it turns out the most common mutations are alcohol dehydrogenases 2 and 3. And there's two types of mutations you can have. Either there's just a straight mutation in the structure of that enzyme, or there's another, another case whereby the expression of, this, of these two enzymes, or one of them, um, go sharply down. So that means that overall your concentration of that enzyme goes down, and therefore if you have less enzyme, you can't get rid of as much ethanol. So there's more ethanol that's in the liver that escapes it and is able to get to the brain. So what does that mean? Well, it means that it has implications in alcoholism. And one of the statistics you can look at is certainly people of Asian descent and then also Native American descent, they're, they're very susceptible to alcoholism. Um, I believe those are actually the, the two ethnicities that are most susceptible. And in general, those ethnicities have a very high incidence of having alcohol dehydrogenase deficiencies. It doesn't mean that the enzyme is completely gone, like they just don't have it. They do have it to some extent, but in terms of the concentration of the enzyme, it's drastically and significantly reduced compared to, um, say, somebody that doesn't have a deficiency at all. So these people are more prone to having alcohol leave the liver, get into the periphery, and that's one of the direct causes of alcoholism. That's just a little bit of background on alcohol dehydrogenase. Let's actually look at the mechanism of how this occurs. It's a pretty simple, straightforward mechanism. We noted in the picture down there that we just came from that it is an NAD-dependent enzyme. And the structure of NAD is shown over here. This large structure, you can see it's a nucleotide, adenine, ribose, two phosphates, another ribose, and then we have this nicotinamide group. This over here, this is NAD, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Um, there's also a critical serine residue that's, and a histidine residue that are both going to be involved in proton transfers. There's a zinc cation here. We'll look at the function of the zinc in a minute. And then there's also this water that we're going to use this term called bulk solvent. When we say um, there's bulk solvent, of course the solvent's water. But usually what we mean by that is there's some water there that's going to have some proton transfer type of um, activity, meaning that we're going to need the water to do proton transfers to initiate um, this whole thing. Okay, the zinc is a cation. It has a positive charge, two, two positive that is, and it's positioned very close to this oxygen of ethanol. That's what this is right here, right? This molecule, that is your ethanol right there in the active site of the alcohol dehydrogenase. And the zinc has a positive charge. It therefore creates a positive electric field, and it's close enough to the ethanol alcohol group that it's able to polarize the oxygen. What does that mean exactly? Well, when you have an atom that's polarized, it means that the electron density in that atom is shifted in one direction or the other. Well, in this case, what it causes by having this positive cation very close is it causes electron density, particularly from the hydrogen in that bond, to be very much drawn towards the oxygen. And so what you end up getting is a very high partial positive, or excuse me, not a positive, a partial negative charge on that oxygen. 
that that generation of the partial negative charge is going to drastically um, I'm going to do this in blue, it's going to drastically weaken this OH bond, and that's going to ultimately facilitate um, the proton transfer to ultimately occur. Okay, so let's look and see how this happens. The initial proton transfer, and I'll do these steps in green, is going to be catalyzed by um, the water here in the active site, the bulk solvent. Okay, so what's going to happen is water initially is going to deprotonate this histidine right here. That's going to force a, essentially a tautomerization. If you need help on tautomerizations, we have videos on that too. You're going to get a rearrangement of these uh, pi electrons. This uh, set of pi electrons right here, this double bond, is going to come out and it's going to take a proton from actually the ribose of this NAD, which might be a little unintuitive. Then what's going to happen is this, these electrons, this bond is going to break. They're going to come out and abstract the proton from this critical serine residue. Then this bond is going to break. It's going to take the proton from the ethanol, and then that's going to ultimately catalyze the oxidation because, remember, this OH bond is exceptionally weak now because of the polarization due to the zinc. So now you're going to get carbonyl formation like that, and since that's the oxidation, you have to have loss of a leaving group, and it turns out that leaving group is this hydride right here. The hydride is going to leave, and it's going to come onto the NAD ring on top, and that's going to force a rearrangement of these pi electrons. And that is going to give you, ultimately, let me scroll over, that's going to give you this molecule. This molecule, remember, that is acetaldehyde, which also is toxic in its own right, but for different reasons than ethanol. In fact, I'll just say it right now, acetaldehyde is also thought to be one of the contributors to the hangover. There are actually several factors that play a role. One of them is um, antidiuretic hormone. One of them is acetaldehyde, and in another video, we'll look and see that another one's actually acetic acid or acetate. But anyways, what we also get out of this reaction, as you can see, is we get this reduced coenzyme, and this one is NADH, the reduced form of the coenzyme, and actually it's of very great use to us. Um, there's a playlist we have on the electron transport chain, or the respiratory chain, and we'll see that NADH can actually be used by the respiratory chain to promote the synthesis of adenosine triphosphate. Although, in theory, um, Alcohol or ethanol should not be your uh, main source of generating ATP. That's certainly by no means healthy. You need uh, lipids, carbohydrates, and amino acids to do that. But anyways, this is how we oxidize ethanol to acetaldehyde. And you'll notice if you look at this critical histidine residue right here, um, it's actually the tautomer of the one that you see over here. Well, essentially what's going to happen, not directly, but it's actually going to be catalyzed by bulk solvent. But... Um, indirectly, this uh, nitrogen is essentially going to get back that proton and you're going to regenerate the resting state of the histidine, which is shown right there. Okay, so hopefully that gives you an idea of how alcohol or ethanol is metabolized ultimately to acetaldehyde. Remember also that we do have ethanol, that's this molecule right there, but there are a few other alcohols that we could have too. We could also have methanol which is just CH3OH, that's methanol. We could also have another one called isopropyl alcohol. These are three uh, pretty common ones, and each one of these can also be metabolized by alcohol dehydrogenases in an identical mechanism. We just saw what happens when you do this to ethanol, you get acetaldehyde, right? If you do this to methanol, you actually get formaldehyde, okay? There's actually a separate pathway for getting rid of formaldehyde. That's in another video, and you can look that up as well. Isopropyl alcohol, you can do the same thing. Here you got aldehydes when you did this. Look, here's the aldehyde functional group of acetaldehyde. Um, formaldehyde is a special case of the aldehyde where you can look at the aldehyde. Actually, both sides are aldehyde in nature. When you do this to um, isopropyl alcohol, you have two carbons here, so this one in the center is, is secondary, so you actually don't get an aldehyde, you actually get a ketone, and this one is called acetone. 
Turns out there's another metabolic pathway to get rid of the acetone that we can look at in another video, but not here. So hopefully this gave you a little bit of intuition on ethanol metabolism in humans. Just remember, this is primarily a liver enzyme. And what we're going to do in the next video is take a look at a different method for getting rid of ethanol in the liver. Alcohol dehydrogenase was a cytosolic enzyme. It turns out there's a microsomal system. Um, and that's what that what, when we say that we mean it's in the smooth ER of the cell. And it's a it's a P450 type of reaction. And it also gives you acetaldehyde. However, what we're going to find is there's actually three ways to get rid of ethanol this way. This one using alcohol dehydrogenase is by far the most important. And in normal cases, this enzyme is the only one that's actually really used. In cases where somebody is to consume enormous amounts of ethanol, or they have a deficiency of this enzyme, then the microsomal system of P450 um, oxidations of ethanol, then those start to become a little more important. And that's what you actually see in people who have a genetic deficiency of this enzyme. As we talked about Asian, uh, people of Asian descent and also Native American descent have very high deficiencies of this enzyme. And therefore, the microsomal system becomes more important. There's also a third, a third uh, string of enzymes that can do this. There, it's uh, catalase. Catalase can also do this in the peroxisome. And that is of negligible importance. In general, it's not really ever used. You're usually using alcohol dehydrogenase as the most important and then the microsomal system.